Brewster, thank you. You always have a great way of um, connecting the dots, if you will, uh, from the, the basics to the bigger picture and what we're trying to achieve and why. Um, I think I'm going to start with, uh, you know, again, kind of drawing this down to the personal level um, and kind of really get into what we're trying to do and why. Um, both, I, we had talked about this early, you know, uh, you and I had had a conversation, yeah. oh, it must have been over the summer. Um, and I was relaying the story of my kids uh, who are both getting homeschooled at the moment, virtual classes because of COVID. And the way school districts um, have books is you'll have, they will purchase, you know, 40 or 60 copies and those will be available for classes. And each class would read them in turn and they would circulate between different classrooms. And in this environment where everyone was virtual, particularly in the spring, there was no in-person um, ability to, to read those books. Um, and there was also no opportunity for my kids. So my kids spent all of the first, second semester last year and this semester uh, not reading any novels, which I think is the worst of all possible solutions. Yep. Um, that the rights, you know, the, li the school district didn't have the rights to the physical copies that they had, nor could they purchase them. And I think that's a tragedy. Um, and I think this is maybe punt, punt to you with a, with a kind of, again, softball question. How can we solve this problem? And what's, isn't there a role for libraries? Um, uh, this is the librarian's day, right? This is, this is when we need to stand up and do something. Um, so yes, all the schools were shut down. Uh, we had 360 million books suddenly not available to anybody that we'd been depending on and investing billions of dollars a year and uh, not available. So that was the, the start of the pandemic and the Internet Archive geared up its controlled digital lending um, to do the National Emergency Library. It only ran for six weeks. It was only meant to be temporary. We've learned a lot through that, that actually there were some that were going and trying to do classroom readers. That makes sense. Um, but an awful lot of our users were in and out of these books within seconds. So we would, we had been going and lending things out for two weeks. Um, but that was way, way too long to speak to Aaron's issue of how long the people we watched. Um, and, you know, we don't know IP addresses. We don't know who's who, um, but we watched and it, people were in and out of these books like web pages. Um, and that was an eye opener for us. Um, so we uh, started going to the one hour. And even when we go and look at the one hour, that's way too long for most of the uses. Um, so I think it's more like people are standing next to the shelves. Um, but I think that but you're, you're right. The bigger picture is we have an education system that is in disarray in large part because of publisher uh, restrictions. They are selling more ebooks and more physical books than they ever have before. Um, uh, it's, they're, they're going gangbusters. They're proud as hell and patting themselves on the back. Um, but the um, level of participation in the real need out there is small. Um, there are um, some programs to go and make some things more available, but it's really on the fringes. Um, it's really not uh, answering the problem. We have an opportunity. We're all homeschoolers now, right? All, every one of us, we're stuck at home, right? We're all staring and we're in some living room somewhere. Um, and that uh, is going to be more of our future than, than we ever knew. It's the jerking forward. Um, so can we go and have libraries with their budgets? with their service organizations um, and their mentality make uh, a huge difference? Absolutely. And I'd say the big thing is digital ownership. Controlled digital lending is weak. It is lame. Let me just point out, when we did you know, controlled digital lending, it wasn't because it was a great system. It was just the only system that we thought we could do um, where we digitized a book and made it available to one person at a time. And I think people haven't tried it. Please go to archive.org or go to openlibrary.org and check out a book. And it is 
kind of clunky. It's, it's kind of bad. Um, if this is where we are in 20 years, we'll all have failed. But it's what we thought we could do. And we've been doing it since 2011. And that the publisher sued the Internet Archive during a pandemic. I don't know. I mean, really? Um, and it also, uh, the going through the courts is, is a, or legislatures end up with these rulings that are uh, much less nuanced than, than things, than just gentlemen's agreement is what they, uh, um, is what Binkley called the agreement that was made in 1936 of how do you deal with microfilmed materials with publishers. So um, I don't know. It's uh, maybe we're hopefully with this, uh, the, the, the sun is shining again. There's a new year uh, among, uh, maybe we'll go back to actually having conversations rather than throwing lawyers at each other. It doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And one of the things uh, Nancy was talking about earlier at the start of the day was um, libraries exerting their uh, rights, if you will, or, uh, you know, uh, power, I guess is a better way to put it, as the people, as the purchasers of this content. Um, I'll, there's a lot of really bad licensing um, from the publisher side in terms of uh, kind of crazy language in licenses um, that especially, uh, particularly when, it, when you're talking about licensing content for a library market. Let's talk about you know, specifically licensing for a library market. Um, wondering about your, from your perspective, some of these issues regarding, you know, why are you, why is the library, why is the library community giving away rights that it already has, um, notionally through copyright exemptions, etc. Yeah, I I concur. I mean we. Publishing and libraries have always worked together and uh, for a long time. Not always, you know, you, you look, there's always been conflicts, but it's $12 billion a year in the United States, about three or four billion of that goes to publishers products. It's a lot of the publishing industry's revenue. Um, the, um, what the Internet Archive has been doing is buying what we can, buying eBooks when we can and scanning what we have to. Because frankly, scanning a, into an old PDF is I mean, if you have to, because it's out of print or the, you know, old or it's great, but if things are available anyway, just buy it. And so we've been looking to buy things. And we, we did a big run at that 15 years ago during the whole Google books thing. And there was not a lot of answers of yes. Now they're starting to be. So PM Press uh, just sold us their whole catalog. We just got an okay from another uh, pat, uh, uh, publisher to get their whole and we're buying it. Like, not, not with license agreement that, you know, terms of service that nobody, what? No, 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 no. buy it. And, and then we have the same rights that we have with a, a, a physical book. This can work really well. It can work for a lot of reasons and for a lot of players. I mean, if you have a .com at the end of your email, it always seemed strange to me that the people wouldn't sell things. It's like, aren't you a commercial business? Oh yeah, but we only put our things through one vendor, whether it's Amazon or iTunes or something, one vendor and uh, they set the price. And I think when somebody controls your distribution and controls your pricing, you're, you don't have a business, you're a division. Um, and that's what happened with music and they snapped out of it. And yes, that's continued to evolve. Yes, it's now um, Spotify and things like that, but it evolved. Um, and, but you can buy MP3s. Why can't we buy EPUBs? And I think that would just make things a lot easier. Also licenses, they're static documents that last forever. And if they ever terminate, then actually your digital books suddenly disappear, which is bogus. Um, but even if they don't, the license stickers around forever. And frankly, times change. And what we can do with things, you know, who would have thought of machine learning or, you know, how do you trust things, that these are exemptions to copyright, not to licenses. And so I think all of our, if we are going to sign something, then it has to say that every legal use is legal, even into the future. But I think we can just make it simpler. Buy ebooks. Um, and libraries will then lend them out. Just we buy and lend things. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. And we have three to four billion dollars to do it with. Let's go and buy books rather than do these 
funky licensing things. Yeah, it, it, it often seems like a kind of trapped in the, you know, the music world in the 80s where it was like, I had an LP and then I needed a cassette and then I needed a, a CD and then I needed an MP3 file. Uh, like how many times do I have to keep buying the White Album? <laughs> Um, and the White Album made it. I mean, one, one thing you don't know about all those other albums that didn't move forward. Um, and boy, a lot of print material didn't move forward. I mean, it's just not in ebook form. So it's not a compensation issue that I think is really going on in the case of most publishers. It's a control issue. Or it's some, um, maybe I'm le le leasing out on things and my lawyer said, I can go and make this happen. And it's like, how about just selling stuff? Um, and let's go and evolve a system that works for more than just one player. And that one player right now is Amazon. And it's, um, if that's, if you basically go and make it so that they're the only place that you can get these things and they control a large percent of the book publishing industry now and the EPUB uh, industry, we, that movie doesn't end well. Um, it's not a game with many winners. So how do we make it so that there can be lots of booksellers um, lots of readers. Cory Doctorow's good on this, uh, on the author side. There's Authors Alliance. There's there's people that are really sort of pushing the idea that let's have lots of winners. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, since this is NISO, since I'm an infrastructure geek, um, how do we address some of the problems um, that Aaron and John were talking about earlier in terms of, you know, this is right now a clunky kind of process. Um, it is a difficult one to scan all of the material. We're probably not scanning it at high quality. And, and maybe some of this has already been scanned at a high quality. Um, you know, are there ways setting the legal set aside to build an infrastructure to make this an, an easier process uh, for yes. people like Aaron. And, and NISO actually was helpful um, so far in this. Um, there's this, why don't we make it so the publishers and libraries can distribute electronic books electronically in a distributed way. So you have a search engine to help you find what you want, and then you go and download it directly, uh, maybe with a payment uh, and get people paid. And NISO actually helped uh, we called it the book server protocol. Uh, you called it a, uh, there was a four letter acronym that I can never quite remember. Um, uh, OPDS, OPDS. Uh, OPDS. Um, so that's a start. Um, so that can make it so that, so maybe we can, we libraries simply E is going for that. There's different things that we can do such that you can draw from multiple places. Um, now, what else can we do? Um, the, if I were uh, MSU, I would only go to the scan if I had to. What if, you know, another uh, kid came along and they needed access to it? Let's just buy another one for 20 bucks or 50 bucks or whatever textbook costs to an individual and the library then buys that and then lends that to uh, the users. That would shut, cut off a lot of those. Um, but, you know, it's just not an alternative. You know, they just can't buy it. Um, so what can NISO do? Um, I think help streamline interlibrary loan. It can streamline um, ILL protocols haven't moved forward for decades. Um, we can go and make it so that publishers can sell directly from their websites. Now we've got internet money, um, the cryptocurrencies, you can actually pay for things um, online. Um, you know, of course you can still do it with PayPal and the like, and that still all works. Um, let's get people, let's get a game with many winners and standards are better than platforms in that way. So there's a you know, famous article by Mike Masnick about platforms, uh, versus protocols. So can we go and have protocols help us interoperate with each other, um, rather than a platform where one controls it all. We know how that movie ends. Um, it, it, it's not pretty. Yeah. Well, and you know, in the in the back and forth that we had prior to this, I was talking a little bit about, you know, I asked a couple of questions about interlibrary loan. And I see that as a crucial, crucial linchpin to get helping, um, helping Joan and Aaron avoid this 
big problem of scanning the file, right? Yes. Because someone somewhere probably has done, and like, why if Minnesota has scanned it already, why are we replicating all of that effort? And is there a way that people can signal to the community, yes. you know, maybe maybe this copy hasn't been scanned, but maybe the Internet Archive has scanned that copy, right? Certainly we make things available to people for the blind and dyslexic, that's straightforward. Uh, we have a system where people can join into the open libraries program at uh, the Internet Archive, um, where they sign up and they we basically weave together the books that they're keeping off their shelves with books that we've already scanned and they just get turned on and you can borrow those uh, electronically. That's good. Um, if there are books that are missing, then uh, we can expedite because we have scanning centers all over the country. We can scan things often within an hour or two. Um, so it's a, um, uh, well, 12 hours uh, for, for a large book all the way through the process. Um, and but that is a, uh, uh, but an awful lot of these materials have already been done. I think we need to work together, uh, coordinate our actions uh, more efficiently. We, we, libraries are completely dependent on publishers. And I would suggest that publishers are dependent on libraries, at least traditionally, when libraries did their preservation function. We're now, uh, I was wondering, when did libraries give up on the preservation function and say, it's now your problem to go and digitize all your past archives? Was that... Uh, or, or preserve your old archives. Wasn't that what libraries did? Um, and somehow we wandered out of that. Sometimes with these consortia, the JSTORs and the Hathi trusts, um, that sometimes, you know, uh, become more in line with the publisher's interests um, than uh, necessarily the library interests. So how do we go and make this work? I think anything that has only one in it is almost always the wrong number. You need to have multiple players um, to be able to keep a commerce going, evolution going, um, evolution. And uh, um, yeah. I think you're access. getting some push. You're, you're getting some pushback in the chat about libraries giving up on uh, preservation. I don't think. I, I think. I think though there. I think you might have a point there. That could that be sold, so to speak to the publishing community as a service that the library community provides, you know, as they have done historically um, for the publishing community. And, you know, maybe not um, something that the library community has to, you know, gets paid for, but could get recognized financially in pricing, you know, hey, we're providing you a service for, you know, long-term historical preservation of your content, not just it's good for us. There are some real puzzles. I mean, if you're a university librarian, you know who you're trying to serve. Or if you're a public librarian in Boston, you know who you're trying to serve. But what happens when you have something special that's available to everyone? Who pays for that? How do we go and uh, Cornell University has got the best ornithology uh, databases that are available to the world. Who pays for that? Archive with an X. Um, was developed um, by Paul Ginsberg at, uh, at Los Alamos and then moved over to Cornell. Who pays for that? Um, and should that go, get spun off into its own little nonprofit that then goes and makes its own business model work and then start to protect um, and provide, make for scarcity of that so people will continue to pay them? Or is there more public um, monies uh, available? I think of, you know, the library system is in the public good uh, area. Um, so how do we go and, and uh, make that work for services that might be served by other libraries? Um, a puzzle. I don't have all the answers. Um, yeah. yeah, it is. It is complicated. It is a certainly complicated space. Um, question came in from Jill. Um, wondering where leadership would come for that. Um, who needs to be involved in those conversations? Because we seem to be very decentralized. I mean, the library community is very decentralized and there are very various components like the school librarians are very different from the academic librarians. Um, 
and having the community speak as one voice is often hard. Uh, do you have thoughts? And there's a there's a new organization um, uh, that um, is sort of in formation called Library Futures um, that I suggest people uh, think about using as a convening environment around specifically the digital um, type of realms that's sort of distinct from yet the, the ALAs and the ARLs work very well for the brick and mortar uh, libraries, but what about some of the issues that are coming around around CDL particularly, um, but also so a whole digital uh, ownership thing from the library perspective. And it's, um, I, I, and, but these conversations are starting to happen. And I think it's really been kicked forward by the pandemic um, that we can't deny anymore that mostly kids these days want it digital. Um, so let's figure out how to do our jobs in a digital distribution uh, world. Um, I think there's plenty of money. Um, there's plenty of people wanting to get things done right. Um, I just don't think we're spending money well. I think we're going and building silos um, where we don't need them. Um, we're putting on these you know, long-term license restrictions that are just weird. Um, and so I think we can get back to, let's make things that people need, sell them, um, and uh, try to, to uh, ex exploit the different parts of the, of the system. If the publishers really starve the library so much, the funding for libraries could just go away. Um, it, you know, it's, it, it's not God given that there are going to be libraries. You look around the world, a lot of other countries don't have the public library system or even the school library systems that we do that they'll, they'll become just customer service departments and wither uh, away. So, uh, and I think that's more than just, oh, there's a constituency we're not, there's a function that, uh, that, that we in the library world do that we need to move uh, into the digital realm. Um, and it's dependent, I would suggest, on digital ownership. Yeah. And time for just one more question. And this, again, um... I think this was uh, uh, something that Nancy raised this morning uh, during her talk. Was was this issue of like taking risks and being bold? Uh, I'm fairly certain you, when you set out uh, with the the project earlier this year, weren't like, oh, I'm going to be bold and you know come come after me, uh, <laughs> but yeah. many, many institutions are not as risky as the archive is. And how do we deal with that? How do we address that? Uh, A lot that risk of organizations are already doing these things. They just don't talk about it. I mean, there's an awful lot of scanning and sharing of these materials. They just don't talk about it. Um, but that's kind of like having a speed limit for 15 miles an hour when everyone's going 50. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, and the Internet Archive did try to, you know, put forward what we've been doing for nine years. And we needed to adjust it quickly, which we then adjusted and brought down the NEL by having the one hour lens, which actually gives us what we were uh, looking for out of the NEL. Um, the... I think we need to go and understand the world has changed and going and trying to read our CONTU guidelines for interlibrary loan again, isn't it? But we have the nice thing in this copyright law, it's fair use. It gives the United States a mechanism of adapting. Um, and let's find a system that works for commercial players, for non-commercial players, but most of all for readers. Um, I think we're shafting them um, that the, the, we have had a year where I'm not sure these kids are gonna get it back. And it's not all our fault, um, but some of it is. Um, so we should be doing whatever it is we can um, to adapt to this new world and not just get tied up in endless, I don't know, protests where people are, are getting killed. Um, it's just, that's not the way forward. Um, and it's not the way I've worked. So I helped get the World Wide Web going. I was on this 
since 1980, it was before the World Wide Web. I got for the first publishers online then. Um, I got the first search engines going. Um, I got television archiving. I got way, the, we started archiving the web. We, start, we made the Wayback Machine. All of these were done, it, we did control digital lending starting in 2011. You know, why is there a lawsuit now? I think it might be some of the pandemic kind of like Twitter madness that uh, people went through. And hopefully calmer, calmer people will prevail and we'll come up with a system with many winners. As much as, you know, yes, I had some Amazon stock, but I don't think they should own and control the whole darn thing. How many trade publishers are we down to now? Um, and how many uh, large academic publishers are we down to now? Ah, this doesn't make sense. Well, um, a bigger the consolidation, uh, market consolidation is a, a bigger issue, which we won't have time to get to in our last 30 seconds. Um, but Brewster, I want to thank you so much for taking the time today. Uh, this is, you know, it's always great talking to you. It's always great hearing your opinion and, and your perspective on these issues. So thank you. Thank you. And if anybody would like to try CDL, uh, go to uh, contact Chris Freeland at the Internet Archive. You can try out with your own books or just try going and downloading some things. Just try it. It's, it's, it's a lot less than you think it is um, yeah. in many ways. Um, and I think that people have made, built it into something um, more, it's more like those cassettes during your LP era. Um, it's, um, let, let's, let's build a CD together. <laughs>